Have um, you guys enjoyed the Olympics so far? Yeah? Has someone, uh, who's been watching the Olympics? All right, only a handful. I thought so. So um, I thought I'd give you a bit of a highlight reel um, of some of the most, um, I think, like if we think of the human race and like what happens in the world, just some of the most beautiful stories that have happened over the past few weeks um, at the Olympics. And the first one, um, I've got all their pictures up on the screen here, but the first one is Hassan. Did any of you guys see her race? All right, she was running and um, the lady in front of her tripped, which made her trip. She fell down, straight away got back up and from behind ran all the way to actually win the race. Um, if you didn't see it, go home today and Google it. An incredible story of just perseverance and no blaming, just falling down, getting back up again and finishing the race. Um, the other incredible story was the two high jumpers. I don't know if you guys saw this. They were competing against each other um, and they couldn't actually top one another. And eventually one of the guys just said, hey, can we actually share the gold medal to the official, and they said yes. One of the craziest things that has ever happened at the Olympics. Um, but when I read up about it and I saw a bit more of the backstory, what's so incredible is that the guy, um, one of the guys wasn't actually supposed to make the Olympics because he had a broken ankle, and um, it was like a road to recovery to actually get to Tokyo. And the other guy had actually broken his ankle many years before, and knew that whole experience. And so it was such a moving moment for them to share the gold medal. Think about that. Isn't that crazy? I, I mean, when I think of the Rugby World Cup, I can't imagine sharing the World Cup with anyone, right? I mean, think about it. This is everything that these athletes have actually worked towards in life to actually win, and they share that together. Um, another beautiful story for me was um, one of the South African swimmers um, this past, um, during the Olympics, who, who actually crashed a world record. And one of the beautiful things that happened is as soon as she had finished the race, her opposition straight away swam over the lanes, went to her and celebrated the world record that she had um, done. Isn't that crazy? We don't see that in life. We don't see our opposition celebrating our victories. Another beautiful story is the 62-year-old who won himself a medal at the Olympic Games. And just this past week, the 14-year-old who achieved a perfect 10 and won herself also a gold medal. And then um, my favorite is probably this one. It was the women's triathlon event. And um, one of the women had come stone cold lost um, in this triathlon event. And um, another lady who had competed walked up to her and she said to her, she said, hey, you're a, there's an explicit word there that I won't say, fighter. You're a fighter and this is the Olympic spirit. This is what the Olympics is all about. How I don't know, when I saw these stories just through um, the Olympics, I was like, man, this is exactly the kind of spirit we want to have here at Gracegate. A spirit of where we where we together, where we're cheering one another on, where we're actually celebrating one another's victories. And if we fall down, we get back up and we keep moving forward. And that is exactly what Gracegate is all about. So if it's your first time here today, um, I want you to know that you're in a really safe place where we are working towards um, trying to figure out and have the same kind of spirit. So we've been in a series called the... The long game. Hasn't Malcolm done a great job? Um, I don't think we will forget this series of the long game. But um, over the past two weeks, we focused on um, a few different topics. We looked at self-discipline. Um, we also looked last week at teamwork. And today, I want to speak a bit about focus. Focus, focus. Where's your focus? And Carissa, could you give me that camera quick? Best way I could think of just introing focus is to, to pull out a camera, right? Because this gives us a, a, a really good picture of what happens with our focus. And um, wherever I focus, let's say I'm focusing you on Matt. 
Oh man, I can't even take a picture. <laughs> this is still warming up. There we go. Wherever I focus, guess what's going to happen? What's coming out? A photo of who? Of Matt, right? Here we go, Matt. <laughs> hope it, I hope it was in focus, all right? <laughs> but we know this, right? This is, this is pretty, um, you know, this is basic. This is, yeah, we know it. We know it when we take selfies all the time. Um, you know, we make sure that we're focused and this is on us. And whatever we take a photo on um, is going to develop. And we're not surprised by that. Um, what you focus on is what develops. What you focus on is what develops. What you focus on breeds. What you focus on grows. Um, what you focus on, like, you, we feed it. It's fed. What we focus on is watered. So today, where's your focus? Where's your focus? If your focus is um, on bitterness, guess what? It will develop. If your focus is on doubt, it will develop. If your focus is on hate, it will develop. If it's on lies, those lies will develop. If you focus on false beliefs, um, they will develop. If you focus on faith, it will develop. If you focus on love, it will develop. If you focus on gratitude, it will develop. If you focus on joy, it will develop. We're not surprised by this. this. This is something we all know. It's nothing new to us. We know that you will never get something different to where your focus is, right? You will never get something different to where you're focusing. It's amazing for me to think about these athletes who've been competing at the Olympic Games. I mean, they're competing against the world's best, all right? I mean, they know who their opposition is, but all of them, when they go into a race, guess what they're thinking? Guess what they're focusing on? What are they focusing on? Winning, right? No matter who their opposition is, no one turns up at that race thinking, oh man, I know I'm not going to win this race. No, all of them turn up at that race and that competition with this hope and with this mindset and with this focus that, hey, I've got a chance. Today I've got a chance. You never know what could happen. You never know what could happen. I've got a chance. And they all focus on victory. They all focus on victory. So where's your focus? Where's your focus? I believe, and I truly believe this, that the enemy's greatest weapon against us as humans is to make sure that our focus is on lies, on false beliefs, and on the mistakes that we've made in our lives. I truly believe that that is his greatest weapon against us in life, is to make us focus so much on lies, on the false beliefs, and on some of the mistakes that we've made in our life that kind of um, makes us lose the battle over and over and over again. Paul knows this and he describes it in Romans and he says, hey, this is the only way to actually get ahead in life. And he says this, he says, hey, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, by changing the way you think, by changing what you're focusing on. He says, hey, honestly, if you want to be transformed in life, you need to adjust your focus. The enemy wants you to focus on those lies, on those false beliefs, on the mistakes that you've made. But actually, what is really going to bring transformation in your life is by renewing your mind and changing the way you think. So where's your focus? Where's your focus? Have a look at this, this video quickly. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. 
But did you see the moonwalking bear? Isn't that crazy? Isn't it so crazy that it's easy to miss something that you're not focused on, right? It's so easy to miss something that you're not focused on. But check this out. If I play that video again, guess what everyone's going to see? The bear, right? Because once we've seen it, we can't unsee it. Once we've experienced it, we can't unexperience it. You know, for some of us sitting here today, I think you're not too sure about this whole God thing, and that's okay. We've created this church, especially to be a safe environment for that. But I'm wondering if the reason you're not too sure about this whole God thing is because you're not really focusing on it. And maybe you, you focused on all the lies, the false beliefs instead. Maybe some of the reason we're not actually seeing God is because we're not even really focusing on it. Maybe the reason we're not really seeing God is because this is a tactic of the enemy. This is one of his greatest weapons is to make sure that we don't focus on God, that we don't see him. You know, it's incredible for me to see that throughout the Bible and throughout scripture, over and over again, the authors communicate that God is not hiding that God is not hiding, that God wants to reveal himself to humanity. Over and over again, um, it's communicated in Deuteronomy 4. This is what one of the authors say. They say, but from there you will search again for the Lord your God. And if you search for him with all your heart and soul, you will find him. Luke expresses the same thing. He says, keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. And Jeremiah summarizes it like this. He says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart, like with everything, where, where, where you give me your full attention, where you surrender. And I loved how the other translation says, if you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. So where's your focus? Where's your focus? Where's the enemy trying to distract you? Where's he, he taking your focus each and every day? Today I want to share a story that I believe can help us to make sure we, we don't lose track of our focus. It's a story that happened ages ago. It's about the, the story of the Israelites if you don't know much about the Israelites, they were kind of God's chosen people. He was for them. He was with them all the time. But they end up in slavery. They end up in slavery and they, they sit in Egypt as slaves for, for a long season. Until God actually raises a leader and he calls Moses and he says to Moses, Hey, I need you to actually go and lead the Israelites out of slavery. Moses straight away says, oh, who am I? Like, you can't use me. I'm not good enough. All right, straight away just feeding in on the enemy's lies. But eventually Moses takes up this challenge and he goes and, and with the help of God, he leads this nation out of slavery. Unfortunately, as he leads the Israelites out of slavery, they find themselves wandering in the desert to where God actually said, hey, I want to lead you to this promised land. I want to lead you to this land where you're going to experience freedom. You're not going to be captive anymore. But along the way, they find so many challenges. And at points, the Israelites are actually even begging to go back to their old life, to go back into slavery because they feel that slavery was better than living a life where they're not actually sure which direction to go to. It's incredible that through this season, God shows up over and over and over again. But at the same time, the enemy keeps attacking the Israelites. And so today I want to share this story and we, we pick it up in Deuteronomy 
where the Israelites are actually being attacked by the, one of their enemies. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 25 from verse 17. It says, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. When I read this and I thought like, man, what wimps, right? What wimps, the, the Amalekites, these enemies were of the Israelites that they wouldn't face them face to face. But what they would do is they'd strategically go move around to the back to those who were worn out, who were tired, who were struggling on the journey, and they would attack them. They'd attack them. So this is happening in Moses as their leader. He decides, hey, this, this can, cannot go on. And we find the story it continues in Exodus. And this is what Moses says. Moses said to Joshua, Joshua kind of being his apprentice and the guy who would lead um, in the battles. He says, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Moses shares with Joshua, he says, hey, I want us to actually draw a line in the sand and say, hey, no more, no more. We're being attacked. All the ones who are, who are um, lagging at the back are being attacked and actually we need to stop the enemy and we need to focus and actually fight back. We need to start fighting back. So Moses shares with Joshua and he says, hey, I want you to get some men together. And then he says, tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Wait a minute. Did you just hear that? Do you hear what Moses is saying there? When I read this, I was thinking, what? Yeah, Moses says to, to his troops, all right, to his best Joshua, hey, I want you guys to go and fight the enemy. I want you to go into battle. And guess what Moses is doing? Hey, he's going to go and chill up on the hill with the staff of God. I mean, when I read this, wouldn't you think that, that Moses as the leader would say, hey, I'll lead the way, like I'll be in front, and all of you guys follow me, let's go into battle, and we fight together. But it's interesting, if we don't know the context of the story, we're missing something supernatural that actually happens just a chapter before. You see, what happens before is that these Israelites are all struggling, and they're actually they, they're actually craving water. They're in the desert. And God reveals to Moses and he says, Hey, Moses, I want you to take that staff, that stick, and I want you to strike a rock. And when you strike that rock, water is going to come flowing out that rock. And he does it as an act of faith and water comes out. See, yeah, Moses was actually saying, Hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to intercede. I'm going to go on top of this hill and I'm going to actually proclaim that God is actually with you guys during the battle. So he does this. And um, the, very next, oh, the very next verse says, Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. You see, the very first thing that I think we need to actually um, compete in this like journey of faith and life is we actually, in this context of focus, we actually need victory, and it requires faith. It requires faith. It requires, hey, actually, I'm not going to actually just keep looking down, but I'm actually going to fight back. I'm actually going to trust in God. I'm actually going to allow God to do what only God can do. In verse 10, we see, so Joshua, he goes and he fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses Aaron and her went to the top of the hill. And as long as Moses held up his hands, check this out, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Isn't this an incredible story? Yeah, Moses decides, hey, I'm going to go up that hill, but I'm not even going to go up that hill alone. I'm going to grab two of my closest friends. And he goes up on the hill with his two friends and as they are in this battle, Moses lifts his hands up, all right? He lifts his hands up. And as he's lifting his hands up, Joshua 
and his army is actually winning the battle. Whenever he let go of his hands and he sort of lowered his hands, they would actually be losing in the battle. Man, I thought about this this week. I thought, what's the significance of this? Why does he do this? And I thought like every single, um, you know, race and thing that I saw this, this past week, every athlete who competed in a race and they won the race at the end of the race, what would they do? They'd lift their hands up, right? They'd celebrate. They'd lift their hands up as a sign of what? As a sign of victory. Like, I mean, that's what they do. I haven't seen an athlete kind of like, you know, after a race, looking down. They lift their hands up as a sign of victory and celebration. But this is interesting because when Moses is doing this, it's not at the end of the race. It's not at the end of the race. It's still in the beginning. Like this is at the start of the war. This is at the start of the battle where Moses decides, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to lift my hands as a sign of victory and trust. Like God, I'm trusting you in the very beginning of the battle. You know, I think so many of us, our, our problem in the context of faith is that we only want to lift our hands and trust in God right at the end of the battle when we've seen God actually do something. Otherwise, our hands are in our pockets all the time. And we're looking down. Where is God? Why isn't he helping? Why, where's the breakthrough? I can't overcome this battle. But young Moses shows us an incredible posture of faith. You see, something we see in the story as it goes on is then Moses hands grew tired. Love this. They took a stone and they put it under him and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. I mean, this is the whole day, all right? And then it says, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Incredible picture here. We see Moses with his hands up, victory, proclaiming God. Anytime his hands would drop down, the, the army would sort of, you know, they would lose, the Amalekites would gain ground. So he'd keep his hands up all the time. This posture of victory. And then, just like us, in our season of faith, we'll grow weary, right? We'll grow tired. And then, isn't this a beautiful picture of what Bree just spoke about last week of team? Where actually, hey, Aaron and her actually hold his hands up. They give him a stone to sit on. I mean, just picture this. Can I grab two of you guys? Carlos, can you guys help me out? I mean, look at this. This, this is exactly what faith is all about. I've got my hands up, but I'm getting tired. And now, hey, Carlos, you got to help me out. No, you got to hold my hands, bro. Yeah, right? And then, hey, this hand's also getting tired. All right. In other words, just look at this picture of victory. Even when I can't, through my own strength, see victory, my friends are helping me. They're holding me up. They're showing, hey, there's a God. Like, keep your hands up. Keep your head up. You're going to get through this. You're going to get through this. They even gave him a stone to sit on. Thanks, guys. You're legends. Just give him a hand. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what faith is? Because I can tell you how many times throughout my faith journey, I've grown weary, I've doubted, I've been like, man, I'm not exactly sure about this whole thing. And it's because of friends. It's because of people in this community, in this church, have actually said, hey, Wiz, just keep going. Keep your head up. Keep your hands up. You see, victory requires friends. Victory requires friends. The story ends like this then. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will, listen to this, completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. God's referring to, yeah, to Moses. He says, I want you to write this down. I don't want you to forget what I've just done here. All right. 
write this down. And he says, I will completely blot out the name of this enemy. This enemy that keeps coming and attacking you when you're worn out, when you're down and out. Remember, I am the God who's going to give you that victory. So Moses does this. He builds an altar and he calls it, the Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. And if you don't know what, what that means, it, it's pretty much like it's this, this sign. And I thought of it in the context of Olympics that there's this flag, right? Have you seen when everyone wins a race, they actually hold this flag um, behind them? And what is that a representation of? Their country, right? Who they're running for. You see, and this is kind of what Moses is doing here. He's saying, the Lord is my banner. In other words, like, I want you to know the victory has come, not through my own strength, but I'm a representative of what God is actually doing in and through my life. He said, because hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. You see, what's the story got to do with our lives today? What's it got to do with focus? Well, it's got everything to do with focus. It's got everything to do with our lives because I know in this community, we're struggling. We're in battles all the time. There are things we're struggling with and we're losing focus and the enemy is gaining ground all the time. But there's a God if we would just actually, hey, put our faith in him. You see, victory requires faith. Victory requires, friends, victory requires that we remain focused. That's how they overcame and they won this battle. So today my question is, where's your focus? Where's your focus? Where's your friends? Where's your friends? Do you have friends? Do you have friends who would actually hold your hands up and say, hey, don't lose sight of who God is and what He wants to do in your life. See, I think we've got acquaintances who often will just say, yeah, man, that sucks, eh? Yeah, your life is hard. That's hard. But actually, we need friends who would hold us up, who would say, no, stop looking down. Keep your head up. Keep your hands up. Faith requires and victory requires friends. And where's your faith? Where's your faith at? I mean, it's easy to lose faith. If we look around and we see what's happening in this world, it's easy to lose faith. But it's just as easy to have faith, to trust, to see the beauty in life, to see that God is for us. You know how I see this is, is because when I look at this picture of focus, right? I have to look at where God's focus is. Where is God's focus? God's focus is on you, on you, every detail of your life. It's always been on you. That's the kind of God that we worship here at Gracegate, a God who is all about me and my story, a God who is all about you and your story, a God who really wants to come in and help you and bring you victory and help you to overcome. And you know how I know this? It's because this God showed up on this earth 2,000 years ago. He showed up and, and he lived a life, a humble life, where he decided, hey, I'm going to let go of my deity and I'm actually going to take on the form of a human being and I'm going to live a life of focus, focus for humanity, for every single person. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do exactly what Moses did thousands of years before, is I'm going to lift my hands up and I'm going to pay the price for every single battle that you face in life. And I'm going to overcome that because I'm going to actually be raised from the grave. And when I'm raised from the grave, what that means is that whenever I face a battle in life, I can know that the victory already is guaranteed because I look to the cross and because I see that Jesus has actually had his hands held out, not for himself, but for you and me. 
so that we can have the victory. You see, that's the amazing thing of faith and in God. He says, you know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes, whoever focuses, whoever trusts in Him will be guaranteed eternal life, life of freedom, life of purpose, life of meaning. Today, we're going to listen to a story and we're going to celebrate someone who really went through a really difficult season in life, but actually focused, focused and decided, hey, victory requires faith. Victory requires focus. And we're going to listen to his story and we're going to celebrate today like we haven't celebrated in a long time. So sit back, relax, and let's hear the story. Okay, um, kia ora na. my name is Jashom. Um, yeah, and I grew up, uh, Otara growing up was, was rough and ready. It was like a, um, like a once we're warriors type setting where, where the drinks start at seven and the fight starts at ten. All that kind of stuff. Um, just grew up around a lot of um, just disorderly behaviour, a lot of drinking, lots and lots of violence, uh, lots of fighting. Um, and we were poor, we we're quite a poor family, um, but somehow we seemed to just get through every day. But for some reason there was always money for alcohol and cigarettes, but there was never, there was never um, uh, money for food. So I learned how to steal at a young age, it was just to just basically feed myself really. Yeah, so growing up it was, um, yeah, it was just very ugly as a child for me. And being the last, I, I often got bullied a lot, got sort of thrown around like a rag doll a lot, often got blamed for anything wrong that went, uh, that went in the house, I got blamed for it. And also growing up, I never, I remember I used to question where, where I came from. And I used to question, is this family really my family? Are these my brothers? Is this my mum and dad? Because of the way, sorry, because of the way I was, I was treated. <coughs> I felt like an outcast. I felt like I, I never belonged um, to, to the family. And growing up, I am. Um, I just felt like I wasn't a part of this family. Yeah, the way I was beaten and, and, and treated and just being abused in, 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 every, in every way that a child can be abused. I grew up like that. And it was hard for me to, um, to, to find my way because of it. I sort of lost my identity and um, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out who I was, trying to figure out where I belonged, um, trying to figure out where my actual mum and dad was, trying to figure out um, just who I was really. And I remember um, like finding out about all my brother's names and um, I got a brother who lives in Tahiti and then, and then I, um, I asked my, my mum and dad, what, what does his name mean? And um, his, apparently his name means Taina or Penga, which in our, in our, in our language it means, it means the last son. And I was like, oh, so then who am I? So I you're Gerasoma. I said, oh, what does that mean? What does that name mean? And it, and it, means, um, it means a stranger among strangers or a foreigner in a foreign land. And I was like, oh, so does that mean that he's supposed to be your last son, so where do I fit? And I, was, I, I always remember growing up feeling pushed out, um, just feeling not wanted. Um, even growing up, there was a lot of things that I had to deal with. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm what they call a prodigal son, you know, someone who's realised that that, that, that they need God in their lives and that they need some change and just somewhere to belong. And um, 
<clears throat> I remember going to Bible study. I, I ended up with this this youth group who was just full of troubled teens. And then one night, as I was leaving, my dad said, "Where are you going?" I says, "Oh, I'm going to Bible study." And he goes, "What are you going to Bible study for?" And I said, "Oh, I just I want to learn about who God is, and this is something I want to do." And he said to me, "If you if you walk out that door, you're not my son." And I said to him, "Oh yeah." So I, I, got, I got angry. I was already angry before that anyway. And I said, if I'm not your son, can you tell me whose son am I? And he said, you're the son of Satan. That's who you are. And that affected me for all my life, all my adult life, throughout my teenage life. And I think growing up like that, it, 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 it affected how I felt inside and it made me feel more lost. I went to prison for the first time in 1999 um, or because of my brother, he, he tried to stab me with a knife. And I, I took the knife off him, but at the time the police were rung and they were told that um, there was someone fighting on the road with a knife. And because when they came, I had the knife in my hand, so I was arrested. And I was blamed for it. And then I was told to leave my house. I wasn't allowed back in my house. And that's when Pardon me, that's when things went worse. And then I, and I got, I was already heavily drinking and drugging because of just trying to suppress a lot of things in my childhood. I often heard voices. Um, there was that devil's thing, you're the devil's son. It always kept playing in my ear. Uh, you're, you're, you're a reject, um, you're nothing, you're useless. You'll never be anything, uh, you're unwanted. I hate you, I wanna kill you. All that kind of stuff played in my ears all the time all the time. So I left and then I went and I stayed. I, I got connected with a church and I stayed up in Pakaranga. Um, and then my mum and dad were going to lose the house. So they called me back. They said, come, come home. So I, I came home and I said, I'll, I'll come home. I'll, just if you let me turn our garage into a sleep out because by then I became a plumber roofer. They said, yep, we can do that. Then I came home, did that. Things were going around for three months and then my family in Raro needed some help, so they kicked me out of the sleep out. And they told me to go sleep in the little room inside. And I struggled with that because, because I, I felt it wasn't fair. And, and I felt that um, it's that same old, you know, just, just treat it like, just treat it like mud, really. Treat it like someone that was insignificant. Just used and abused. One night I was drinking, and then I, 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 um, I picked up a barbecue table. I don't know how I did it. But in, in my rage, I picked up a barbecue table and I, and I threw it at my dad. I tried to, tried to hurt him with it. And then he rang the police, got a protection order on me, and then, then I was kicked out of my house again. And I've had that protection order for um, more than 18 years now on me. And then um, uh, eventually I, I went to prison for breaching that protection order. I spent another year in prison. About 13, I got out. Uh, and once again, I tried to to, to change, because I knew uh, what was going on in my heart was, wasn't good. Uh, I had a lot of unforgiveness and resentment in my mind and in my heart. So I, um, I started one day just to start believing in myself and try and put out the voices in my head. And I started a, a plumbing company called Watertight Designs. And I was going really well, um, doing really good, and then I, um, my dear mother, she, 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 had a, she had a heart attack around 2017. And that, that affected me too, because my, my dad, as usual, he blamed her, her sickness on me. He said, because it was, he said it was my fault why she, why she had a heart attack. And I kind of, I took, I did take that on. And it really affected me when my dad told me, this is all your fault. And then the next day she died. And I can't, I can't be there for a long time. Anyway, things got worse after that. And I ended up back in prison. Um, I had a couple of guys that I had, I asked to work for me to help me out. And then one day they decided, I don't know why, but they decided to use my van to rob a dairy. And I ended up back in prison. And I literally lost everything I worked for. So I got on my knees in my cell and I just surrendered. And I spent two years, eight months in prison for a crime I never did. 
and that was hard. But the greatest thing of their two years, eight months, I, I, I read God's word, and I wanted to know who he was, and I wanted to know who I was. And I also I remember reading a scripture that says that if anyone is in Christ, you're a new creation. And, and I said to God, and I said, if that's true, if you can make me new, then please make me new. And as I read God's word, I got to know who I was. I got to understand that I'm not a reject. I read a word, I'm not sure where it's from, it's, I think it's Philippines, it says that, that you're no longer a stranger, you're no longer a foreigner, but you're a member of the house of God and a citizen of heaven. And that something in my brain switched when I read that. And for the first time in my life, I knew who I was. For the first time ever in my whole life, I understood what it meant to be a child of God. And I understood that, that everything I believed that I was, that my dad told me I was, that I was a reject, that I was useless, I was good for nothing, that you're not my son, you're Satan's son. All that stuff was just a lie. And I remember reading in, I think it's in Romans, it speaks about that you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind and you can be transformed through God's word. So what I did in prison was I'd, I'd write scriptures down and then I'd hide it down the side of my pants or, or, or I'd hide it down my undies. And then I'd walk around the prison and then I'd just pull it out and then I'd read the scriptures and then I'd hide it back in my pants tuck it in my shirt and I did that for like a year and a half just walking around just quoting scriptures I'd go to the toilets if, if I'm feeling down and, and I'll read the scriptures to help me change and it changed me and I remember one of the guards were doing a pat down and he lifted my shirt up and this paper fell out he's like what's this because you're not allowed to pass notes so is this a note and I went no so what is it? I said, oh, it's scriptures. He goes, what, from the Bible? And I went, yes. So said, what are you doing with this? And I just said to him, I want to change. I don't want to come into prison. And he gave it back to me and he said, keep it up, keep going. Because I don't believe in God. But if it works for you, then here. Um, I res recently restored my relationship with my dad after 18 years. That was a special moment to be able to just say, look, I forgive you and I'm sorry too. And I release you of all the hurt and unforgiveness that I held against you. And I think that's the greatest thing about God's word. It's the power to forgive someone, no matter what they've done. And I understand now that's the power of what Jesus did in you. See, if you want to be forgiven, Jashom, then you forgive others. So I said, yes, I'll forgive them. You know, it's been, I celebrated three years of being clean from any addiction. I've never been that clean in my whole life. Three years is a long time for a man like me. And that's all because I basically use God's word to change what goes up in here and what goes on in here so I don't have to listen to lies. I remember it says that, you, that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. And it has. And I've never felt so free in my whole life. I never knew that you could have a relationship with God where you know that God's actually for you. That you know that no matter where you go, it's, it's quite weird, it's like wherever I go, it's like his hand, just like this. And it's, it's, it's following me. And it feels amazing, you know? I have no fear. I have no doubt. And I remember a, a word, I can't, I think it's in Psalms 121, it says that, that God will keep me from all harm. He will keep me from all danger. And he'll protect me as I go and as I come, both now and forever. When I read that, I just knew I'm gonna be all right. I have nothing to fear. And I think for the first time in my life, I've, I've understood there was a God. 
and that he's real and that he's as close than, than I could ever imagine and ever known. I've never felt this peace. I never knew that you could experience this kind of peace. I never knew that you could experience this kind of joy without having to use or having to have alcohol. And for three years, I haven't had to do that. And for me, that's, that's the greatest gift, is to actually have that, that peace and that joy that the Bible talks about. Because to me, when you understand that God's actually transformed you and changed you in such a way that's real, and when you've seen him move in your life in such a way that's real, you can't hold back. You can't hold that back. It's not right, and it's not fair. I mean, if you asked me three years ago, Jashom, do you want to get up and sing in front of the church and the worship team? I would say, hell no. What's wrong with you? You got rocks in your head. Get out of here before I knock you out, eh? Take that mic away from me. Don't be stupid, you know? I would never be seen dead singing in front of a church. Because first of all, I didn't believe in myself. And secondly, I didn't think I had a good enough voice. But that's the power of God. If God's really changed my life, I want to sing about it. Because I want to sing about what God's done for me. And I want others to know that not only can He do it for me, but He can do it for them. And I want to sing some more. And just be uncomfortable for God, you know? Be in an awkward position for God. And that, that, that's how I roll because I just know that that God's real, His Word's real, His power's real, His love's real. And I don't want to hold back anymore. And every day it's a surrender. It's not just that one-off thing I did in 2018. I surrender every day. And um, I've gone through the Bible twice, no, actually two and a half times from back to front. And this is what I understand about the Bible is that one, God loves me. And that two, God wants me to live a life of love. And three, he just wants me to obey him and just trust him. So then when I figured that out, I just put the Bible down. I was like, right, it's time to be about it instead of just reading about it, you know. And that's what I choose to do every day, just be about it. Well, today I'm choosing to get baptised because one, I do believe that Jesus died for me. And I do believe that he took my place on the cross. And I do believe that through him I can be forgiven. And I do believe that through him I can have a relationship, not just with him, but with God. And I do believe in his resurrection power, not just to change my life, but change the life of those who choose him, you know? And that's why I want to be baptized. And it's, for me, it's, it's more than declaration. You know, to me, it's, it's, it's a life I want. It's a life I know it's true and right. And I want everyone to know that I'm a Christian. And I choose God and no one else. And I choose to live according to His word and no other way. And I'll do that for the rest of my life until I die. And that's why I want to be baptized. morning. I was waiting in the cubicle in Mount Eden and the guards brought in a guy who sat in front of me and they shut the door behind them. My first thought was what a rugged beast. <laughs> but you know Man looks on the outward appearance, mm. and the Lord God, he looks upon everyone's heart. And after being there talking with your song for half an hour, 40 minutes, God showed me what he sees. And as Jashom left the cell, I saw a beautiful person. And that's what we have here. You know, in the houses, he lets his light shine. 
He honestly does. He lets his light shine out to the other guys in support of living. He lets his light shine out to the strangers he meets. He sure is a beautiful person. Thanks, Jashom. Jashom today, um, yeah, is an incredible defining moment in your life. Um, you shared about, you know, so many defining moments um, in your story. And today um, is going to just be the top of all of them. Um, where all of those just, you know, get sort of buried away and you get resurrected, just like you said, as a new creation, you know, in God and just believing the truth, the way God sees you. And we're so proud of you today. And um, it is an absolute privilege um, to be able to baptize you today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whoa! 